Hello, and a joyous welcome to This Woman's Work, a space where you can hear and read about some amazing women, the fantastic jobs they do, and the paths that have led them to where they are today. So, I'm here today with Mary Claire. Hi, Mary Claire. Hello. Um, could you could we start by you telling the lovely listener what it is you do for a living? Of course. I am a consultant plastic surgeon. I'm a plastic and hand surgeon. I'm based in the NHS. I work full time in the NHS and I'm based at the local hospitals, Peterborough and Stanford hospitals. Yeah. But in order to know how you even got into that, we've got to start with like not baby Mary Claire. <laughs> But like whippersnapper Mary Claire, well, haven't I think, we? Yeah, that's very relevant actually, because whippersnapper Mary Claire was, I, I do remember always being really interested in sort of how the body works when okay. I was growing up. And I used to just, even in primary school, I would look at books of the skeleton okay. and things like that. So there was obviously some kind of innate interest there but your parents aren't doctors or anything like that well I do come from a bit of a medical family right and and I'm at the end of I've got five brothers yes four of us have gone into medicine so I would whilst I wouldn't say that I went into medicine because of them I think medicine was always very familiar to me so my my dad my mum and dad were both dentists they met at dental school um and then my dad went on to do medicine but eventually practiced as an orthodontist in the children's hospital down in brighton my interest in it as a career and really my where the support started for me to pursue it that really did start very young yeah when i was growing up and there was never any question that if that's what i wanted to do that's what i would be supported to do brilliant so yeah, when you when you've sort of got an interest in that, I think it was it really was pretty obvious to me going through sort of career fairs at school that medicine was what I wanted to do. I just did the subjects that I needed to. Lots of people like me would go through medical school with a really open mind as to what specialty they'll do. Okay. Some people they might say, "Oh yes, I think the lifestyle of this particular um, branch." you know general practice is commonly thought to be one that's a bit more suitable if you want to have a family or work less than full time um and hospital medicine is often seen slightly differently but those are just stereotypes but so some people might feel that they gravitate towards one or the other but I kept it quite open until right at the end did my sort of house officer years you know you qualify you do your house officer years and you basically work as an apprentice in a hospital. In a hospital, yeah. so I was based at St all Mary's. those medical dramas that we all love. Yes, like exactly. Anatomy, like the in, um, whatever the, the intern, or, yeah, yeah, residents and interns, yeah, okay. and that sort of thing. So yeah, you, so you have to do that, then, do you? Even you no matter what to, level of medicine, you have to go and be exactly. You have to be a what they the, call now a foundation doctor. Yeah. What was then called a house officer. And you go through and you do that in medicine and surgery. Right. And then everyone qualifies. And at that point, it's when I did it, we were like an apprentice. We were part of a team. You could really see what you would be doing if you went into that specialty as a career. Okay. that's why surgery was what I did. I really enjoyed it. It was... It was something that I could see myself really fitting into. It's really practical. You've got kind of... You have to make a diagnosis, but then you act quite quickly on that. Yeah. And yeah, so then you go into surgery and you follow a a specific path. Because surgery is very fixing things isn't it yes exactly yeah rather than other things are treating things exactly it's problem solving finality not finality because i'm guessing it isn't always like that but it's more is it more direct fixing it is you see your outcomes really quite quickly you see a problem you fix it yeah and it's and that mindset is very surgical yeah so that almost is kind of like generally if that's how people's mind is they go Yes, More I think into surgery than not into surgery. Yes, and was there any other? So at this point, so hang on. So your house officer is that for what three years? Four no, years? so you do one year okay. house officer when I did it, and then you will decide whether you go into medicine, right? General practice training, surgery. So then I did three years of surgical, what we call basic surgical training. You learn your surgical skills. You then have a sort of set of exams. You become a member of the College of Surgeons, and that's when you are. A surgeon. We've missed a whole education chunk here, which yes. is obviously college, 
Then uni. Yes. Um, where'd you go to uni? I went to Cambridge, so... Um, and how long is your was your university stint then? As six years, it, it, I was going to say because we've talked all these other years later on, but we've missed that big that chunk whole of chunk. years. Yeah, and actually, so yes, I so I went to Cambridge initially. Um, I did what they at the time was called a preclinical course. So I did all my basic sciences, anatomy, physiology, at Cambridge. You get your degree from there, and then we used to reapply. Um, it's more common to stay in Cambridge now, but a third of us would go to Oxford, a third of us would stay in Cambridge, and a third would go to London, and I went to London. Right. And that was a great combination for me. Yeah. So I sort of went from a small place, then to a bigger place. And in fact, I then completed all the rest of my training in London. Did you? Okay, so you've done your six years. Yes. Then that house office house bit officer year, is then yeah. your first year, is year seven. Yes. And then... Then you've got another three years yeah. of surgical training and then you've got at least six years of your specialist training. Bloody hell. So it's 17 years. <gasps> 17 years. So how old are you then? <laughs> so you're like 18 plus 17. I can't even do the maths of that. What is that, like early 30s? Yeah, or? so to get a... So the but earliest... Equally, it's kind of almost comforting as it a is. normal person it is yeah they don't just let you just start cutting people open in your 20s because let's face it most people are just idiots in their 20s well i think that's right there is there is that element that you need your supervision years are yeah. obviously quite extended and, and you become a bit more senior as you're doing it you're training on the job you're obviously earning as you're doing it yeah as we know the junior doctors are not that happy with yeah. their current salaries but um, you are earning and it is an apprenticeship. So you learn and learn and learn until you get to the stage where you can get on to what they call the specialist register. Then you've done all of your final examinations. There's another set of exams at the end of your specialist training. Then you have to go through a little process and you get on the specialist register and then you can apply for consultant jobs in the NHS. Wow. So it is, it's a big commitment, but it's, it's a very well-trodden path. So it's not difficult to see how to achieve it. Yeah, yeah. And were you doing anything pre this? So like pre-18-year-old Mary Claire? No. Any little jobs? Oh, I, wanna, I, I want to feel like, what, yeah. Saturday jobs? Oh, so my anything? Saturday job. Yeah. yeah, my Saturday job, I worked in Waitrose in oh. Brighton. It's a really, it was one of the first Waitroses, I think. Um... Anyway, yep, Saturday Girl in Waitrose. I worked as a lab technician at my school. Wow, That was okay. a really good job, actually. Yeah. I could do it after school. Loved anatomy, but was there, do you think there's anything else about you in particular so that that's led you down this path? I mean, obviously, we've talked about the fact that you like fixing things, for want yeah, of a better phrase. That's right. It's a practi It's a sort of a practical approach, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. which I think a lot of people are. A lot of people are quite practical, will see a problem and want to fix it. And I suppose, I think the thing for me about my job um, is that I work, I work with people. I find that really one of the most stimulating parts of it. Okay. You know, um, it's not just meeting people, It's it's being able to do something for people people come with a problem yeah. and you can solve a problem and I think that interaction with people and the sort of laying on of hands you know just kind of physically you you yeah. see people you examine people we saw how important that was during Covid when we couldn't see people face to face yeah. and you, you can't really do surgery like that yeah. you can't you can do some bits of surgery remotely follow-ups and a few bits and bobs, finding be key pieces of information. But you need to examine people. Yeah. And I think it's the interaction with people that so I really like. you like that. Right, okay. What is really nice is if you can give someone a diagnosis. You know, we all love, as doctors, making a diagnosis. It's yeah. like, it's our thing that we get taught. And it takes quite a while to get to know how to do it and you know you don't get it every time and you don't get it right every time but if you get a diagnosis it's just yes that's what it is what challenges do you think your natural personality brings to the role so you've talked about kind of what positive characteristics insofar as you know um loving human interaction or the other stuff we've just discussed but what do you think your weakness is a, is a bad word but challenging characteristics yeah are? no I I think it's a really important question. Um, 
So surgeons are a bit of a breed and there's obviously variability in there. But as a sort of tribe of people, we, we often are quite, um, well, for want of a better word, we're, we're, we're perfectionists. You know, right. we want to get everything yeah, right. Yeah. So I think that it's a bit of a classic sort of weakness to say, but I think that can trip you up as a surgeon you know perfection i had a really great consultant trainer who just used to say perfection is the enemy of good and it really is you Ooh, have okay. to know when things are good enough when not to fiddle anymore when it's you know when you're done when you've got as good an outcome as you can get and you have to know when to stop because yeah. then you have to see what happens yeah and that's quite hard so i think if you're a perfectionist you, you're tempted to just make everything slightly overdo things sometimes when you're actually operating so i think that that is a real that can be a challenge and you learn with experience that's what your training's about but that's also what your consultant career is about i mean can we talk about a little bit about some of your surgeries i mean yeah. what's what have been the most prolific ones or the most memorable or i think for me the area that i I mean, they're all they're all different, um, but the area that I really enjoy and the cases that I remember, cut, sort of over my most recent years, would be the paediatric hand surgery cases because they're little children who come in with teeny hands, teeny hands, oh. and little extra digits or digits that are joined together, right? And you either take out their extra digits in a in a way that's going to work um, for their hand or you separate out their fingers in a way that's going to enable them to use them and and I think those sorts of cases are the ones that a you follow up for the longest because you want to make sure that everything's okay over a period of time yeah. as they grow um, but also they they're great patients they're really interesting patients to see them use their hands see how they grow see how they interact and they they're, they're wonderful patients because they just get on with it and what's the youngest then what's the youngest you've treated well we would operate as young as six months that's probably as young as you would want to go wow. for anything that isn't sort of life or limb threatening and then usually they're a bit older usually 12 to 18 months so quite okay. small so what about what's the oldest then Oldest Ooh, we didn't we did an audit the other day and our oldest patient was 102 so wow so which is and also what, what really was that? impressive am i allowed to even ask Please, what that yeah was? The, um, so these sorts of cases obviously it would be something that really had to be done so this would be a skin cancer right okay so quite a lot of my work plastic surgery work a real bread and butter um part of your practice would be skin cancer work skin lesions yeah. superficial lesions melanomas all yeah. sorts of things so for someone that old to put them through any kind of procedure even local anesthetic it would be yeah. some kind of invasive cancer and they're probably more prone to infection i'm guessing are they or? yes they don't heal as well more prone to infection they're much more you know their whole sort of healing process is often a bit delayed they might have other lots of comorbidities they might be on lots of medications that yeah. make it a bit more difficult so Thank gosh yeah yeah so lots of reasons to perhaps not intervene in that age group but if something you know I, even a patient i i had a patient who was in hospital with cause unknown for sort of had been a bit sort of off legs but had a big lump on their elbow and subsequently turned out through investigations that they had metastatic cancer not from their skin but they had Gosh, this big lump on their skin what is that sorry so they had the sort of cancer all over their body liver bow right from okay. a source from a lung cancer so nothing and it had they, never been picked up and never then been it picked just up spread. but they just weren't very well their liver function was sort right. of all, so essentially they're on a palliative sort of pathway untreatable quite elderly um untreatable because you wouldn't be able to give them anything strong at their age with comorbidities and you know it, it's it's a terminal type of cancer diagnosis Gosh. but they had a big um a horrible big lump on their elbow which was bleeding wouldn't stop bleeding and they they couldn't get home because it was constantly bleeding um they were having really firm unpleasant bandages you know it was just a real horrible situation yeah so for them i operated on them and they actually died four days later but oh, i took their lump gosh, away because yeah. then it 
would make it much more comfortable yeah. for them. I think how you cope with it as a surgeon can be really hard. Some people internalise it. I don't think that's the best way to do it. But you, but you have to force yourself really to learn how to take on this stuff because you can't take on every little thing. It'd be just a bag of nerves. You wouldn't... How do you learn? I mean, is there... So you doctor surgeons you're working long hours yes when you're or when you're training we were working long yeah. hours yeah you do you work long hours but in either yeah. way you long hours yeah so you know you've not got heaps of free time necessarily no 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 that's so, right so you know it, i guess it's that i guess i'm trying to work out what the how this your support network fits into that then it, out of hospital or even yeah. within the hospital like you say so you've got your internal boards that review things yes but that isn't and that's more for patient protection yeah so for you as a surgeon there nowadays there are many more networks and I think that is really key to have your peer group and your work colleagues who you're probably really quite good friends with as well mm. but have those people around you that you can talk to and basically just talk through without people judging you yeah Private, private route. route so yes absolutely i've i've i would definitely I've, I've definitely considered it and sort of decided not to so private practice um surgeons love private practice mm. not just because of the dollar not, dollar bills you exactly are. not just because of that that that's very welcome and yeah. very good and i think you know that that is one side of it but private practice allows you to do things in a way that you have control over Mm, it's going to be a bit more thorough there's a bit more you can just set things up in your own way you yeah. have you know you have your secretary you run things in your way and things are done in your way and that might have been how the nhs worked i don't know 50 years ago I was say, I you, it's not even like 20 years ago is no it? Like, yeah it certainly doesn't work like that now and, that, and that's where i think a lot of the stresses and strains work it, you know for mm. for right or wrong and it's a sort of a completely separate political thing i think it's it is it is difficult being a doctor in the nhs it's difficult being a nurse in the nhs difficult doing anything yeah it's a difficult organization to work in so i think private practice is really attractive because when i was training i did i trained in in aesthetic surgery and i went to assist and i helped and i saw what private practice was like and it is, is really nice part of the... it's part of our training okay. so it's oh, part of our yeah we get examined in my specialty in plastic surgery yeah on aesthetic surgery so we're all trained in so you've it. almost got to have that exposure to that you have to you have to know how to um do a rhinoplasty you have to know yeah. how to do all sorts of aesthetic procedures some hospitals require you to do what they call an extra session for, of nhs work in order to do private work that's written into your contract okay so you're already doing say 40 hours a week they might require you to do 44 until you can do private and then right. you can do private work um some might say we won't let you reduce your NHS work to facilitate private work, although they can be complementary. But of and course, this it... is all about license. We're really talking here, aren't these? So the NHS really is also. I mean, what's? Sorry, my mind's completely gone blank. What's the medical body or you know? Oh, the GMC. Yeah, the yeah. people that are obviously giving it. So this, what you're really talking about, is the people that are controlling your license well, and when you can not, practice, are you? Or? Not so much. So the GMC, they do. They are the overall body that sort of um, they're responsible for doctors. Yeah, and you have to. They put you on what's called the specialist register. They own the specialist register. So the GMC will regulate us. So NHS and private? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to be a GMC member. You have to have, be GMC registered to do any yeah. kind of clinical work. Um, and they will put you on the specialist register, which is... So all tr doctors in training will be GMC registered, but they won't be on the specialist register. Right. When you're on the specialist register, you are a specialist. Yeah. And that usually means you can get a hospital consultant post or you might get, you know... I don't know, some kind of post for in in some kind of 
appropriate unit, you know, some kind of community set up or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So they will regulate you and give you your license and your fitness to practice and they do your revalidation. But the it's the NHS trust which really employ you with a contract and those are the ones who try and who will not usually be able to sustain you dropping your NHS sessions right. to increase your private practice. So normally what happens is people end up leaving. Just fully leaving. Fully leaving and, and becoming fully private. private yeah. Which is, it's a different type of work, obviously. Um, it will be mostly aesthetic. Um, a lot of it will be, there will be some NHS work. You know, there are lots of NHS um, contracts within private hospitals, overflow work. You know, you could be seen as, you or I could be seen as an NHS patient in a private hospital by yeah, somebody. Yeah. So that's a well that's a well recognized pathway, but most of your work will be slightly different as a private surgeon. Yeah, I guess I am one of those people I don't find money that motivating. I I, I just it's don't know why you went into this. No, at all. Yeah. and I always I always find it um slightly more annoying to commit to extra work I just don't see the money as a real yeah, attraction yeah and so yeah that's that's probably why I'm not that attracted to private practice as well I just don't have that pull it's yeah. just the money is just not it for me oh <laughs> that's lovely though well you know what it's lovely for everyone isn't it? as long as everyone's happy I, I think that's right I think some people do like yeah. it and that's and what... obviously and there's it changes a lot of people's lives doesn't it it's life-changing that, yeah and so I think there's a lot of value in that sort of surgery they're really really is and so I wouldn't ever I wouldn't ever say that um I wouldn't do it personally or professionally yeah. and I think but it's a it's a it's hard work yeah. as well you're there all the time yeah yeah well I think people are paying for it yeah it's the a completely different setup the is suddenly a whole it's a whole different set of expectations it's a whole different it? set of expectations and it's a business you have to run it as a business oh gosh yeah and it's interesting to see some people have that sort of business mind very early on, they are always, that's what they were always going to do. They'll have their NHS job for a couple of years. They'll drop that. They'll set up their own private clinic and they'll do really so well. you must know people. You must have been on Lots courses. of people like that. Yeah. yeah. And I worked with people. Yeah. Like that. What's been the absolute best part of this journey for you so far? So far. Gosh, absolute best. I think it's really hard to say what is the best are you thinking sort of best patient, best... It could be anything, something that really stands out as a real, whether it's a hallelujah moment or just a wonderful thing that happened yeah. or a series of things that happened. Anything that's... Were you felt really proud of yourself or... I... Yeah, it's it's honestly really hard because there's so... There are some really... Lots of... There are some really enjoyable parts of it and I think I think the people that you work with it's really enjoyable working with people you work in a team and you can't do anything without your team around you um and those people are often really um inspiring and that is that is a really good part of the job working in a hospital it's really good fun. Yeah. You, you know, you can really have a good fun day. You lose that slightly as a consultant, I have to say. You lose, because you do, t you know, as a consultant, you do work on your own quite yeah. a lot. Not in the operating theatre, you've got your sort of team around you, but you don't tend to do stuff with consultant colleagues. And when you do, you really appreciate it. Yeah. So what I think your colleagues... It's and, almost the people you've met along the way. Yeah, the people you've met. And those people you keep in touch with, they're your support network, they're your peers, they're your friends. Yeah. So that, that is a real high. I think the patients are great. I love working with children. Children are great. They're really honest. When you have a good outcome, that's really... It's really fulfilling. If you've made a real difference to somebody from a positive outcome. And I think in my line of work, you don't... As I said before, you don't really save people's lives. You know, they're not on death's door. You're not cracking their chest open yeah. or anything like that. But you're changing people's you're lives. You're changing people's lives, yeah. You're restoring, mostly restoring function. You're restoring form. And people, it is just wonderful yeah. for when people say, this is great. 
Um, and I'm really delighted with what you've done. You've done what I wanted. You've achieved what I wanted, and that's great. But and, and I guess you've got it from the child, but almost the parents more. The really, pa- yeah. the, child, like we said, the children almost aren't so aware, are they? No, they just get on with it. Yeah, but, but, but it's the parents because if no one wants to see their child with scars, going back to that point. Or, no, yeah. that's right. And I think there is. I think children with congenital hand differences. Um, there's a lot of emotional um, sort of baggage for the parents. Yeah. You know, why has it happened? Why Why my child? Are they going to cope? Are they going to get bullied? There's, it's yeah. very hard for them. You know, they are just acting out every single stage in the child's future. Yeah, yeah. And I think accompanying them on that journey is quite a privilege. Uh, you know, accompanying the parents on that on that journey is quite a privilege. But it is one. It is really challenging as well to try and explain to them that the child. They, they're going to be whatever they want to be. You've got Sarah Story there, you know, with her yeah, yeah. Um, hands. It's, it's the technical term is a sim bracket actually, but basically she's had a, a transverse growth arrest. Like her arm just hasn't grown properly. Yeah. But she's you know achieving everything that yeah. that she needs to. And I think seeing those sorts of people is great for the parents, but it isn't easy. Yeah strangest things that have happened to you in this job and before we started recording I said I was going to ask this question and you were like how long have you got <laughs> kind of thing yeah I think you must have seen some very strange things there's now so queer as folk you know you really see I think this job is great for seeing a real cross-section of society of humanity, yeah, yeah everything um but also I guess even in terms of people's you see Happy, sad, you angry, do. you do um, anxious. You literally are. You see every human emotion. I'm guessing you really do. And probably the sort of strangest things. You don't get too many surprises in clinic, really, but you do sometimes get surprised by people's thank yous and Ooh. and what they come up with. You know, wow, so okay. people are wonderful, and when you have. You know, you get a lot of thank you. You get a lot of thank you letters. You might get oh. um, little gifts. And I think people who really put their sort of themselves into creating these little gifts, you know, we've had, I've had poems about what what I did, Changes, the procedure. Yeah. yeah, and what impact it made, but also what their, how they saw what I was doing. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, people will really think about who you are as a surgeon and they might give you a gift that they that you know that that sort of represents what they feel that I've had people make me a miller coat of arms oh wow yeah, okay. a little shield which so I thought was amazing they researched it and everything yeah, right. really amazing um one of my um hand surgery patients made me some pom-poms you know those little wool oh, pom-poms yeah. to show that they could use their fingers properly yes yeah <laughs> And it's the handmade stuff, you know, patients come in with sort of handmade bags and all sorts of things. It's really... And they obviously have to come back in and give them to you. Or yes. They just, yeah. Yeah, they, so, they come for their follow-ups and, and, they'll, right, be, come, and they'll, they'll be holding right. a, a little bag. And of course you don't expect any of it, but I just think it's so nice. Have you ever been given anything that you couldn't accept? Well, no. Well, I, I think th- it's someone walked up with like, you know, like his... Uh, is the new iPhone 15. Oh, yeah, you couldn't say. accept that. No, but no one's ever done it. <laughs> Don't. If anybody wants to. <laughs> yes, there, there's, there's a gifts policy, and I think, somehow I think patients... Pom-poms, yes. Yeah, must know iPhone, about... IPhone, yeah. new iPhones, no. No. <laughs> so, yes, you should declare anything that's over 20, 20 or £25. Pounds. Gosh, right. But I do, it's not usually... People don't usually give you something very valuable in that sense it's more meaningful it's the meaningful stuff yeah lovely yeah so I think those are the sorts of things that really give you an insight into oh gosh that's I hadn't I wasn't expecting that where you are now where do you think what what's next so I think next five years yeah it's I think it's really useful in my job to think of sort of five year chunks and the first five years I've done your bedding in um I think really the next five years is about growing what you've established. So for me, it's growing my sort of paediatric practice more specifically. So it's really sort of specifics about my clinical work. Yeah. So, you know, plastic surgery 
plastic surgeons they're quite useful surgeons we operate everywhere our whole body we yeah. we do we we help reconstruct areas you know after injury or when things have gone wrong or patients so have... do you get you get called into that though so if someone's say been in a really bad car accident yes how and that's quite common for you is it to get called well, in for some kind it of it would have been in my training but where we are currently we don't have You're, a big yeah, okay. tra- we do we do some um, post trauma post trauma yeah. work and that is an area that we're trying to build so we're a new department trying to build that sort of service for yeah. our local patients because until now those patients would have had to have gone to Addenbrooke or, or yeah. Leicester Addenbrooke's really I think yeah so those two things I think growing my own practice but also supporting um, our own department which is a young department and what about I mean teaching or practicing abroad, anything like that. Because obviously, Sir Luke's eleven. Yeah. When Luke's going, by my mum going off to yeah, uni. Yeah. Eighteen. Yeah. So <laughs> seven years time. I would always consider pra- practicing abroad. I um in between my so this first year as the house officer year and my surgical training, I worked in New Zealand and I loved it. Oh. It was absolutely brilliant. It's it's not so easy. I don't think to practice in as a consultant. You'd have to. Um, go through their training system again the same in okay. America but there's a lot of surgeons who do sabbaticals very lucrative sabbaticals in right um, places like Dubai or, yeah oh wow yeah, yeah. so yeah it's always, it's always a possibility I can't picture you and Tom in Dubai okay my two final questions are always a bit of advice that yes. you would give to younger Mary Claire yes it could be did a young Mary Claire or even just you know, early uni, Mary Claire, is there anything you wish you'd known sooner? Sooner. I think, in, and it is quite personal advice to me, I think everyone has to look at who they are. But I think for me, I I would have said just be more confident to to do more. You know, I, I was, I'm quite a cautious person. My right. practice is quite cautious. In, in terms of making sure that I've got everything, I'm always very prepared for things. Um, everything all lined up. And I think when I was training, that can sometimes hold you back. I think you, I found it perhaps as earlier on in my training a little bit too easy to just say, oh no, maybe you should just show me how you do that. Because right. I'd like to just see yeah. how you do that before I then do it. And I think, you know, you've always got to do something for the first time. Yeah. And you still do stuff for the first time as a consultant, but you've just got a massive toolkit yeah, yeah. to draw from that actually it doesn't phase you in the yeah. same way. So I think that's what I would say to myself personally. You get there in the end, it might take you a bit longer um, but just don't, just push yourself. Keep pushing yourself. Yeah. Um, what was the second question? The second question is just a bit of life advice. Oh, yeah, to life throw advice. Which is more like where you are now, really. Yeah. To throw out to men, women, children into the world. What? My, my, I suppose my, my thing recently, and this is as much advice to myself, is... Um, about being kind to yourself, you know, not just about your job. Be kind yeah. to yourself in, basically, don't be too hard on yourself. Everyone's got to be, my mum used to say this, be kind to yourself, and I don't think I really knew what it was about. Just yeah. be kind to yourself, just nourish yourself, find out what it is that gives you joy. And your job obviously gives you a lot, and it hopefully gives you joy, but it's not... It's not everything. It's not everything. And I, you know, me... At the moment, my job here is a great kind of combination of, I say it's a great combination, there's so many things I could moan about my job, but yeah. But I think I've now got a, a re- quite a good quality of life with a good balance. Yeah. I don't work at weekends yeah. because I've made certain decisions. Yeah. To not do and you, but you've work. also done all of that as well. I've done so, all of that. Yeah. That's yeah, that's well in my past, and I've got all the experience from that. Because you do have to put in the hours, yes, definitely, yeah, when you're training. Yeah. But yeah, quality of life and just being a bit less hard on yourself and finding out what really makes you happy. You know, for me, that's getting in the garden, doing a bit of exercise, it's having that balance. Yeah. yeah, and not constantly doing stuff all the time. And I think that's what my mum meant when she said, "Be kind to yourself." Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary Claire. You are very welcome. 
if you would like to hear more about this chat, see some behind the scenes pics and some personal profile pics, plus read about how to get started in this industry and or this role, then please go and support us on Patreon. The link is on this podcast page and across all of our socials. Sincere thanks in advance.